is Rob Bell. Rob is a best-selling author and international teacher and speaker at the forefront of contemporary Christian thinking. His books include Love Wins, The Zimzum of Love with his wife Kristen, What We Talk About When We Talk About God, Velvet Elvis, Sex God, Jesus Wants to Save Christians, and Drops Like Stars. He has been profiled in Time magazine, which selected him as one of 2011's 100 Most Influential People. His Robcast is regularly the number one spiritual podcast in the world and was named by iTunes as one of the best of 2015. His television special aired on the Oprah Winfrey Network in fall 2014, and he was a featured speaker on Oprah's The Life You Want Tour. Today, we are going to discuss his new book, How to Be Here. Welcome, Rob. Uh, It's great to be with you. Now, I must be one of the few people in the Western world who hadn't heard of you until I got your book for review. (laughs) There's probably a lot of you, let's be honest. (laughs) But I I really am so glad I did. Tell me, (laughs) why did you write this book now? Um, Because I kept noticing that when you're at a dinner party and someone's telling a story about how great they are and how successful they are and how accomplished they are, it's kind of boring. But when somebody tells a story about disaster and failure and walking uphill in the mud in a thunderstorm, and it's something about all the times you fell down and got back up, those are the stories that we actually find interesting. And I realized in my own life, it is the moments when everything fell apart that are actually the moments later that you realize shaped you and formed you. And then I hit my head 15 years ago, which I tell about in the book, and had this closed head injury. And because of the concussion I had, I got like a tour of my life. And uh, it was this extraordinary experience when I saw the whole thing as this extraordinary, holy, sacred gift. And uh, I wrote the book now because I realized for 15 years in many ways... I've been trying to learn how to live with that sense of gratitude every day. And this book is sort of what I've learned. You know, there's just so much turmoil and confusion in the world today. Yes. I think that people really need the kind of help your book offers on on well, great. living. Thank you. Also, <laughs> how to ignite their passion for life, which you clearly yeah. have in abundance. <laughs> um Thank you for introducing me to the term ikigai. Yes. Please tell our listeners what that is. Right. You know, I came across this. I, was, I, was, I saw something on longevity, where people live the longest in the world. And one of the places where people live the longest is an island off the coast of Japan. And they said one of the reasons why is because they have this idea of ikigai, which is this Japanese word that essentially means that which gets you up in the morning. Uh, and... Sometimes it's translated reason for being, and that it's understood that your ikigai will shift and morph and change over the years. And then in many ways, what you're doing with your life is working out your reason for being. And uh, I've heard people talk about calling and passion and vocation and, you know, what you're born to do. But I love the idea of ikigai as an ongoing, fluid, dynamic process that will involve some element of struggle. So, and it's also fun to say, because when you don't know how to pronounce it, you just fake it like you did. A key guy. Let's just assume that's what it is. <laughs> and then I also had met a number of people who, you know, they went to university and got trained in something, um, but then that, that industry changed or they lost their passion for it or they got fired and it brought about this massive existential crisis. But when you you have the sense of a key guy, then you live with an awareness that it'll probably shift and change over the course of your life. And that's not only okay, it's totally normal. And it's to be welcomed, not fought. I must say that I really resonated with that because so many people say, oh, you just have to go and find your passion, you know, and find your purpose in life. Well, we grow, we morph, we we become... Yes, and you aren't who you were. That person has passed. And that there are seasons 
to life. It's interesting in the modern world, with so many people disconnected from nature, living in cement and tile floors and fluorescent lighting, when you're disconnected from nature, you're disconnected from the fact that everything is seasons. It's summer, fall, winter, spring. It's sunrises, sunsets, that ever, tides come in, tides go out, that all of nature is about seasons. They come and then they go, and that it's okay f- for a season to end, and it's okay to let it go and then have a new season begin. That's all actually a very healthy way to understand your life. I've just recently been interviewing people about books related to aging, mm-hmm. and uh, certainly the notion of seasons is very relevant to that. Yes. And finding the beauty in each season, the particular beauty yes. in each one. Yes. And in some ways you have, uh, especially American culture, you have an obsession with avoiding the fact that we're going to get older. You know what I mean? It's like, whatever you do, just pretend like you're not going to die. But in all the great wisdom traditions, you begin with, hey, by the way, you're going to die. (laughs) Now, in these few moments you have here, you might as well really live. What are you going to do? And uh, it's such a better way to think about it. Now, are you still a practicing pastor? Um, that's a great question. My wife says I should should not use that word because for many people that, that they immediately think of an hour on Sunday morning. Um, and I did. I started a church in my late twenties with my wife and some friends. And for about for most of my working life until five years ago, I was a pastor in a local church. And now I write books and I speak in all sorts of interesting settings, and I have a one-man show at a local comedy club, and I uh, create these pop-up events in cities around the world, and I'm just having a blast. So <laughs> not in the traditional sense, although some of my friends would say, you know what, you're, you're like pastoring more than ever. It's just without that big institution in the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, in Preparing for this show, I have been reading uh, about you on the web. Uh, interestingly, you've it's actually... It's all true. <laughs> because on the interweb, it's all true. <laughs> you actually had a book, uh, a biography written about you, which was fascinating. Yeah, yeah that's a little weird. Um, yeah. <laughs> we'll get back to that. But it, I, I had another question. In your pastoral work and beyond, um, what do you believe is the greatest source of pain for people? The greatest source of pain. Uh, You know, it's interesting. There's a writer named David Kessler who says, pain is the thing that happened to you, and then suffering is what your mind does with it. And honestly, I mean, I've seen horrible, you know, families whose kids committed suicide and cancer and betrayal and infidelity, but it honestly, the greatest source of pain is what I have seen is the inner dialogue that people have, that beating themselves up, shame, um, voices that they allow to just pester their mind and heart with their worthlessness. Um, That's what I've seen again and again, is if you can get at those voices that people carry around, telling them that they're no good, that they don't deserve anything, that they don't belong, that they're horrible, that they're a mistake. If you can get at those voices and confront them and drag them out in the sunlight, that's uh, when interesting things begin to happen. And do you think that spirituality is is a way to address that? Absolutely. Just think about like the power of a good mantra. Uh, think about the power of a, of a phrase that you can repeat in a moment of quiet. S- spirituality and having a spiritual practice and believing that your life is a gift and how you respond to it and what you do with it matters is one of the greatest ways to deal with the pain of life. Mm-hmm. Because you can always return whatever it is, however you need to grieve it, however angry, whatever injustice or betrayal it is, you have this gift of life and you have today and you get to do something with it. And oftentimes we we need reminders of what we already know. Um, 
that forgiving people is always the best path, being generous is always the best way to be, um, the joy is always found in celebrating the good wherever you find it, and a path, a uh, spiritual path, spiritual practice, mantras, prayers, teachings, uh, disciplines, they, they bind us together. They bind us as people to each other. Uh, it's incredible what can happen when you have a path. That's the thing. But that's actually the thing about it is you have to hold the whole thing quite loosely. Yes. And I always talk about there is uh, a light on the other side of heavy. And what happened to me is I started out at a very young age as a pastor. And when you're a pastor, what's interesting is people invite you into their inner ring of life. So you're right there in the middle of the wedding ceremony. You're there in the hospital when the baby, after six days of trying to live, dies. Like you're right in the front row of all this. And I kept noticing that if you go all the way into the heart of that pain and suffering, all you're left with is the power of this moment. And all that heaviness actually pushed me through to some other side, took years, uh, to a lightness on the other side of heaviness. And I actually did this event with the Dalai Lama and Bishop Tutu. And what was so fascinating to me is they, when they meet each other, they hug each other, and then they begin tickling each other and giggling. <laughs> and I, I, I did not know this. I'm standing right here, there on either side of me, Hug, hugging and tickling and giggling like young boys. And in that moment, I was like, wait, these are people who have seen the worst human beings can do to each other, and yet they weren't heavy and oppressive and you don't understand how bad it is out there. There was this lightness with them, as if we've seen how bad it could be, so you had better enjoy this moment. Uh, the lightness on the other side of heaviness has just been revolutionary for me. One of the things that so um, attracted me to the book and really engaged me was the way that you describe some of your worst moments <laughs> and then show the, the universal um, message that came yes. out of it. Yes. So, um, creativity, that is the gift that we have with this lifetime. Why do people fear it? Well, there, the whole thing is way more risky than anybody was ever told from the beginning. Um, so in the book, I just walk through, you get to create your life. And you get to shape it and form it. And so for many people, the reason why they resist this sort of thinking is because, well, you know, you don't understand all the things that happened to me. But, but you, how you respond to those events, especially the ones that you never wanted to happen to you, is a creative act. And for many people, they were given a worldview that there is this fixed, static, established world, and then you just go out into it and hopefully you'll find your place. Um, but in the ancient Hebrew consciousness, which, which brought us the scriptures, you have this dynamic openness, this you participate in the ongoing creation of the world. You have way more power than you realize to act, to shape, to form it. Uh, but in, in a, if you look back through history, the way that you build an empire and get power and manipulate people is not by telling them how much power they have, but by telling them how little power they have. So I think for a lot of people, they were just raised in a world where they were told, stay in line, don't break the rules, just do what you're told. And when you say, actually, there's way less rules than anybody told you, and you, you have more power to create your life, it's scary and dangerous and risky, and it's also way more fun. <laughs> <laughs> You have to uh, take that responsibility, too. I yes. Mean, it, it, it means that whatever goes right or goes wrong in your life is because of what you've done, not yes, because yes. of them out there. Yes, and you know, it's interesting. I uh, 
lately in my live events, I will say to the audience, okay, now we're going to do a pop quiz. And I will say to the audience, yes or no to the following questions. And I'll say, did your parents live life as if it's an adventure that you go on or a trial to be endured? And it's unbelievable how many people say uh, it's a trial to be endured. And so for many people, just a couple of questions in, look at what you were raised in an environment that taught you that this is just something you try and get through, which is very different from your life. You are the recipient of a sacred holy gift. And the question that has been the fundamental question for thousands of years is, what are you going to do with these sacred holy energies you've been given on these few years on this floating green and blue ball hurtling through space at 67,000 miles an hour? (laughs) And that just becomes a much more compelling question to ask and life to live. I can understand why you're considered a bit of a revolutionary. <laughs> because, actually, well, because uh, religion <laughs> really has been pulling in the other direction, absolutely. established religion. Absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And, and you, uh, you think about it. I mean, the great mystics talked about radical amazement, um, The modern world was built on standing in mastery over things. You take them apart so that you can build airports and hospitals and televisions. Uh, you You grasp them and you dominate them. But the moments in life that bring you the most joy are not moments when you stood there in a lab coat with a clipboard making observations. They're moments when you were caught up in something, when when you weren't standing at a distance analyzing, you were caught up in in the participation in a moment. And that's just a different way of understanding your life. Uh, Mm. So, yeah, and many of the institutions that were supposed to cultivate this sense of wonder and awe for life on this planet, care of this planet, care for each other, uh, many of those institutions have failed us. So that's why you and I should have this conversation, is all sorts of people are realizing The modern world gave us these incredible luxuries and technology, but it also left behind some things we need to reclaim. Indeed. And the thing that you are talking about reclaiming is the passion that you can have for what you do in the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Now, you say that getting a paycheck for doing what you love may actually ruin it for you. You yeah. also suggest that wealth can ruin people. So, okay, Absolutely. what is it here about money? Well, what for many people, what it helps is to to help them see that they were, however they were raised in whatever world they come from, they were part of a system. And systems always have rules, assumptions. Many of them are unspoken about what matters and what doesn't. But think about how many kids who at some point in their life they expressed a love or desire for something and they were told, uh, that's not, you can't make very good money doing that. That's not a legitimate job. You can't have a career in that. So something within their true self was speaking to them. This is who you are. This is your path. But they were part of a larger tribe, system, institution, religion, whatever, that said, nah, that's not really acceptable. And so they essentially denied their true self and headed in a different direction. And sometimes that different direction was very profitable. Um, There's a social self, the part of us that learns how to play by the rules, how to gain respect, how to achieve. Um, But it's, it's one of the great truths of the wisdom tradition is money is a fantastic servant, but not the best master. And I just kept, I've just met so many people who they got to the top of whatever area they decided to compete in and they're bored out of their mind um, because life is, when it's lived from the heart, it's just lived according to a different set of rules. Mm. And money just makes everything, it's so, uh, it can be so deceiving because people are like, well, you know what, the money's good. Yeah, great. The money's good and your heart is a wreck. (laughs) Come on. (laughs) <laughs> and There's then, this big joke that people come to my events and then quit their jobs. 
So now, <laughs> event, I just say, for those of you who at some point today are going to realize I'm not in the right place and you're going to quit your job, A, you're not the first, and B, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. Um, <laughs> so you you also make a big point of the distinction between a craft yeah. and success. Yes. So um yeah. the the craft is more doing whatever you do with love. So Yeah, if, and dignity and honor and right. I just kept noticing because for for uh, for a number of years, I lived with this assumption. You know what? When we when we get to this point, when we accomplish that, when we achieve that level of success, then we're really going to live. And I I had this feeling like my joy was just up ahead in the road, and if I could just get there, then, um, and then sometimes I'd actually reach that goal. And it, there was this profound sort of existential thud, like, wait, that was the thing we were working for? Um, it's, that, it's that thing that happens when the new car smell fades, and it's just a car. <laughs> and uh, it's like the new car smell of the soul. You were like, oh, if I could just get that then, and then you got it, and you were like, wait, wait, this is it? Um, and I noticed when I would meet people that some people, they were quick to it show to announce to you all the things they'd accomplished and all the things they were going to accomplish. And I noticed how often they were either stuck back in the past, um, resting on the things they'd done, or stuck in the future on all the things they were going to accomplish. But then I also noticed sometimes I'd interact with people and they had this, this humble gratitude that they even get to do the work they get to do. And, and the sense that they are part of a group of people who do whatever it is they do, a mom, an insurance agent, a painter. Mm -hmm. And they would talk with this sense of ex exploration and discovery, like there are these subtleties and nuances to the work. And you're with each year, you gain a bit more wisdom and expertise. And I noticed that the people who often talk the most about success, the question was generally, what more can I get? And people who seem to be in what I would call craft, their question was, can you believe I get to do this? Yes. Uh, and that that, and that, I mean, for, for a number of years, when it, whether it was a, a doctor or a painter or in lots of traditions, it was assumed that you would get better as you got older because there was this growing body of expertise and wisdom and that the surprises would never stop coming because you're exploring and learning and discovering um, and when I embraced being a student, things just got way more interesting. I'm a student. I'm learning how to communicate, trying to be the best spiritual teacher I can be. And I'm going to be doing this till the day I die. And so each day becomes so. Uh, uh, what will we learn talking with Miriam today? Who knows? Let's see. Let's find out. Um, and life got so much more fun and interesting. Well, that goes back to something that we raised earlier about elders and aging. Yes. That too often uh, getting older is equated to becoming useless. Right. And it's interesting, a friend of mine is a physical therapist, and he goes all over the world. He sort of pioneered some new ways of thinking about the physical therapy. And he said that in India, the oldest person in the village is the most flexible person. Isn't that fascinating? Yes. And that the villages in India where he's at, age doesn't bring um, a brittle stiffness, but it brings a loose, limber flexibility, which I thought that's, that's a metaphor if there ever was one. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> well, you know, we could go on talking all day, and yes. unfortunately, we don't have all day to talk. But I really would love for you to tell people a little bit more about your your activities, the the performances, the yes. all the juicy things that you're doing. <laughs> well, actually, right now uh, we do like pop up living rooms. So around the world, we'll uh, I'll rent like a dance hall or an art gallery um, or a club, and then we bring in chairs in the round and we make like a giant living room with all the chairs in 
a circle, and then I'm in the very middle, and uh, I'll, like, present an idea from the book, like, you know, craft and success, and then people will start asking questions, and then I'll go over here, and then we'll go over there. And we, uh, so I do these events all over the place. You can get all that info at robbell.com, where the next ones are. And then uh, I do events here in West Hollywood, where I live. Um, some, um, this fall, like, I'll do an event on communicating for people who communicate in some way, whether it's a podcast or they give talks or messages or teachings or they write a blog. And I'll just do two days on the creative process and how to take something in you, an, a, a story, an instinct, an idea, and how to give it language in a clear and coherent sort of way. So um, I do events for business people and spiritual leaders about heightened consciousness and how you think about your work uh, in the world. So I do that kind of thing. And then I have a weekly podcast where I do my talks and teachings and I interview people. And um, then uh, I have a kid's book coming out this summer. And I wrote a novel last fall about a, a motivational speaker who has a mental breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> Which so I'm sure a lot of people think you have had. <laughs> uh, uh, well, that's actually the beauty of the novel is people are trying to figure out which things are biographical and which aren't, mm -hmm. which I think is just so entertaining. <laughs> so, yeah, I um, and then I have uh, like a one-man show I do at a club here, in a comedy music club in L.A. So I make things, and I try to create spaces where people can explore what it means to be a spiritual being having a human experience, as the great D. Chardin said. And... Uh, I always want to announce good news. I come out of a Christian tradition which believes in a buoyant, joyful, honest announcement of good news for the whole world. So I try to bring good news wherever I go. And I'm having more fun than ever. And, and then I have kids, which is really, my wife and I have three kids. That's really what I do. Uh -huh. The other stuff I just do, I fit in when my kids are at school. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. And your website is robbell.com? Yes. You know, you remind me of this great attempt in the scientific community to come up with something called the unified field theory. Yes, sure. And that's kind of what you're doing at the spiritual level. Ah, uh, thank you. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the best thing anybody's ever said, by the way. Thank you. I will carry that around for days. <laughs> well, it has yes. been an absolute delight speaking with you. And oh, thank you. I want to commend your book to all of our listeners, How to Be Here by Rob Bell. It is a, a slim book that's fun and easy reading and oh so rewarding. So, Rob, thank you again. Oh, uh, you're so kind. Thank you. We'll do it again sometime. You bet. Okay, bye-bye. Goodbye. Goodbye.